We're back in Romans chapter 1 this morning. Romans chapter 1. We're going to start by reading verses 18 through 25. Had a surprise last week. Uh, Facebook fact checked us and didn't like us and wrote their reply in a language I do not speak. So I have no idea what we did to offend the Facebook folks, but we're liable to do it again this morning because we're going to be talking about the problem that calls for the gospel. Paul has already introduced us to the gospel and told us how the gospel was the power of God for salvation. Today we're going to talk about why people need salvation. Romans chapter 1 beginning in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And I want you to hold on to that phrase, without excuse. A few years ago, I got the assignment to teach philosophy at Northwestern. And so I started digging into different things that I thought might be appropriate. And one of them was, is it reasonable to believe in a creator? Is it reasonable to believe that there is a God? And so I ran across some great Western philosophers who had tried to attack that question. Uh, all of these would be after the time of Paul, but Socrates, Plato, those guys that came before Paul wrestled with it as well. My favorite philosopher is a guy named Descartes. Descartes was a mathematician. He wanted to make everything fit logically. That was his life, was to make all the stuff line up logically. He was also a good Catholic, and he came up with a, a string of superlatives that he thought God would have to be if indeed there was a God. So let me give you this string that Descartes came up with, and you decide whether they match up with who you think God is. He is transcendent. In other words, he's not of this world. He is above this world. He is beyond this world. He is other. He is omniscient. In other words, he is all-knowing. There is nothing that God does not know. He is omnipotent. In other words, all-powerful. There is nothing that is beyond the range of the power of God. He is omnibenevolent. He is an all-good God. And he is omnipresent. He is everywhere all the time. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound like it rings true with your understanding of who God is? So Descartes said, if there is a God, that's the kind of God he must be. And uh, we don't have time to talk about all of his philosophy, but he has some wonderful uh, approaches to life in general that were all centered on his belief in this kind of of a God. A couple of other arguments for the existence of God you're probably familiar with. The first one is called the cosmological argument. It's the first cause argument. So you ask someone, well, where did you come from? Well, I came from my parents. Well, where did they come from? Well, from their parents. Well, where did they come from? Where did they come from? Where did they come from? Eventually, there has to be a first cause. What made the universe? Where did it come from? What caused the universe to exist and you'll eventually get to one of two answers either there is a God and he created it or there was a mass of dust and it accidentally imploded exploded and began to make the things that we see now over billions of years uh, if you choose you can believe with all of your heart that life is an accident that it came from the dust, that the Big Bang is the thing. If you believe that it is not, and you need an explanation of how we got here, I believe that the existence of a God who created us is probably the most logical of all the 
explanations. Um, there's an ontological argument. That is, it's a, an argument for reality, something than which nothing greater can be imagined. You want me to say that one again? It's kind of goofy English. Something than which nothing greater can be imagined. So you think of something that is great. Think of something that's a little bit greater than that. Something that's a little bit greater than that. Keep going until you come to a place where there is absolutely nothing greater that can be imagined. Now, did you come up with dust? No. Did you come up with God? Eventually, you have to get to a place that he is all of those things that Descartes mentioned, and then some. He is the greatest of all things that can be imagined. He went one step further. This is Anselm who came up with this. And he said it must be able to be imagined both inside the mind and outside the mind. In other words, not just something we can create in and our, of our own imaginations. God has to be something that actually exists outside of us. So did we create God? Or did God create us? Two hugely different questions. If we created God, then God can be whatever we want him to be. And we'll see from the text here in a little bit that that's kind of the way the world ended up. But if God created us, if there is a God, then we have a responsibility to answer to that God who created us. And here's probably the most common argument, probably one of the best, I think, and that's the teleological argument. That is the argument for intelligent design. Uh, since we are so fearfully and wonderfully made, and the more science is able to dig into the deepest parts of the human anatomy, the more we find out how amazing our bodies really are. The more they are able to dig into the cosmos and to look at things that are stretched out over hundreds of thousands of light years, and they find out the order of the universe the more that we can say there has to be someone somewhere who intelligently designed these things. Probably the most common example is the example of the Rolex. You're walking down the alley and there's a pile of metal and all of a sudden there's a whirlwind and the metal starts flying around and bumping into each other and here in just a few minutes there's a Rolex watch. No one believes that but millions believe that somehow life just happened in all of its intricacies in all of its amazing beautiful nature there must be a designer for something so beautifully designed and the word itself telos from which we get the the argument doesn't mean that it happened just by design but that it happened by design on purpose God set out to do it so when you read in Genesis account, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He did it on purpose. He wanted earth to exist. When he formed Adam and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he wanted mankind to exist. There was a design and there was a desire. And along with that desire, God desired to interact with his creation. So not only does he interact with the natural world, but he also interacts with us on a physical and a spiritual level. He created us to be both spiritual and physical beings. Now, we're going to get in, beginning in, in the verse uh, 20, uh, 21, and we're going to read down to the end of the chapter. Now, I want you to know that that was just the introduction, and my sermon has 10 points. So... If you thought you were going to lunch today, well, it, it won't take long. But Paul lines all this out for us. So you, you'll be able to see the ten points as we read through, and I'll just highlight them for you when we get finished with the reading. But Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. Their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God 
or images made to look like a mortal human being or birds, animals, reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with one another, with uh, other men, and they received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they uh, do what they ought not to be done. Uh, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, and no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things are deserving of death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. A terrible uh, list of things. It all begins by refusing to glorify God. As soon as you decide that mankind is the top of the heap as far as evolution is concerned, and we have no one to whom we have to answer, then everything else begins to fall apart. If there is a God, we must answer to God. If there is no God, then we only answer to the one among us who is the biggest and the meanest and has the biggest gun. If I can make you do what I want you to do, there is no God to punish me later. What a horrible existence we live. But these people refuse to glorify God. Look in the news. Are there people in our culture who refuse to glorify God? They refused to be thankful. They looked at what God had done for them. They refused to acknowledge him as God. And so why be thankful? Whatever I have is what I have earned for myself. Whatever I can take belongs to me. And if it hurts you, you should have been smarter. If I cut a deal that makes you uh, look stupid in the process and I get all your stuff, it was legal. I could do what I want to do. If there is no God, and I'm not thankful to God, if I'm not beholding to God, then I certainly have no responsibility to the rest of his creation. Their hearts were darkened. You ever met someone, maybe someone that you've known over a period of time, and when you first met them, they were alive. And their heart was alive. And their mind was alive. And you see them years later and their hearts been darkened. What's the difference? Not always, but sometimes the difference is they stopped calling on God. They stopped trusting in God. They stopped wanting to have a relationship with God. And if you're not in the light, you're in the darkness. And so Paul says that these folks' hearts were darkened and they began to chase after human wisdom. Nature hates a vacuum. And so when you take out the influence of God, you've got to find another influence. You've got to find something that you trust. If you don't trust him, whom do you trust? And so people find other things to fill up their hearts, their darkened hearts. And they chase after human wisdom. They follow that up with idol worship. They begin to worship things that are made in the image of created things. And the, the reason that people want to worship something is deeply ingrained in who we are as human beings. It's part of us. It's been described as that God-shaped hole that's in all of us. There's something deep inside that wants to find a reason, that wants to find stability, that wants to find that 
that other, that something bigger that we can chase. So if we're not going to believe in the God of heaven, we have to make them for ourselves. When you begin to either worship yourself, which we call humanism, right? Secular humanism, when you hear that phrase, understand that that is an idol-worshiping cult. But we are the idols. Right? We're the, we're the tip-top of the evolutionary chain, so we get to do whatever we want to do, and we worship humanity. Uh, the problem with that is that humanity keeps failing us. Humanity oftentimes does things that is so immoral that lots of the others of humanity die as a result of it. They traded the moral for the unclean. He has a long passage here about homosexuality. If you ever talk to somebody who says that the New Testament doesn't have anything to say about homosexuality, this passage is plain enough. People who have given up their normal desires for abnormal desires. They have exchanged the truth for a lie. And they have exchanged the natural for the unnatural. Now, if that doesn't get a censor, I don't know what will. All you have to do is say that it's not okay. And then you run into problems. But brethren, I... I have a deep and abiding love for every human on the planet. There are some I like more than others, but I love all of us. And some of us suffer deeply because of things that are going on in our lives. And what we need is not to decisively dismiss God for pointing out our problems, but to turn to God for the answers to the problems that we face. They refused to repent. Even with the knowledge of who God is, how God created us, how God has called us to be a certain kind of people, the world refuses to repent. And then they become purveyors of perversion. Not only do they do such things, but they applaud those who do such things. If you have become wise and you don't watch the news, congratulations. For those of you who do, you know that right now there are people all over our Christian nation who are lauding and applauding evil. They are fighting against that which is good in the name of morality. They're calling us to be a more moral people by eliminating a subset of humanity. Now I want us to notice two things. I told you in the beginning. Go back to uh, verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Because of what? They weren't thankful. They worshipped the creature rather than the Creator, and they turned over to an immoral lifestyle. And all of us look at that lifestyle in that part of the passage, and we say, we understand that's immoral. I'd never be part of that. But go down to verse 28. Furthermore, in addition to, alongside, and let me tell you one more thing, Paul says. Just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they might do what they ought not to do. Now look at that list. They were filled with wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They were full of envy. He's getting close to murder. I didn't kill anybody. Strife. Uh, deceit. Yeah. Malice. Sometimes. Gossips. Slanderers. God-haters. Insolent. Arrogant and boastful, disobedient to parents. You're in this list somewhere. We're all in this list somewhere. We may be God lovers and God followers. We may not be idolatrous, 
but we all have sin. And one of the things that Paul is going to keep bringing up is that all of us have sinned, so all of us need a Savior. He opened his letter with the greatness of the gospel and how he's not ashamed of the gospel. And he wants to preach the gospel in Rome. And then he says, let me tell you why I want to preach the gospel in Rome. Let me tell you why we all need the gospel because we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have the same problem. And by looking at other people who have sins that we don't have, we sometimes feel self-righteous and we think about what a great relationship we have with God compared to the relationship that those other people have or don't have with God. But Paul keeps reminding his audience, you have no excuse. You are without excuse because you who condemn them are sinners as well. All of us need a Savior. All of us need to be brought back to God through Jesus Christ. I don't care how much you love God. I don't care how faithful you've been in your walk with God. There's something in your life that has separated you from God. And the only way to bring it back, to get back into that relationship where you need to be is through the blood of Jesus Christ. He died because we can't get it right. The people that Paul mentions and we go, ooh, terrible people. And the things that he mentions that you and I look at ourselves and say, oh, yeah, me too. All of those fall into the same category. All of those fall into the same need for a savior. So again, there's, there's a decline. We start with I don't believe in God. I'm not going to give God glory. I'm not going to be thankful to God. Well, then what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to start making up my own rules. I'm going to decide what's right for me. Have you ever heard anybody talk about my reality versus your reality? This is the kind of thing that brings that on. If I don't believe in God, if I don't count God as an ultimate authority, then whatever I do is right, and you can't tell me it's not. You don't have any authority. If we're the highest rung of the evolutionary ladder, I can do whatever I want, and you can't tell me not to. You say, well, what about laws? Well, laws could be changed. From 1973 to 2023, 22, perfectly legal at any stage in development to kill a human being. Unless, of course, it was born already. You had to kill them before they could escape the world. Our nation, 60 million murders. Why? Because we didn't count God as authoritative. We didn't count him as the ultimate decision maker. We said, we're the highest rung, therefore we get to decide. And we allowed ourselves to sink into a cesspool, which is where we live today. Now, the question is, what do we do about it? Well, you and I have done something about it or we wouldn't be here today. We've chosen to follow God and to listen to his voice. But what else can we do? Perhaps we can reach out to those other folks around us who are still in need of the Savior, who are still in need, to understand that where they are is not where they need to be and to help bring them back toward the Father who created them in the first place. Help them to learn to glorify God. Help them to learn to be thankful, to avoid so many of these things that Paul talks about. Now, when did Paul talk about it? 2,000 years ago. Does it sound like last week's news? Of course it does. The problem isn't changing, and the answer to the problem isn't changing either.